Uh, my name is Elliot Nelson. I work with Michigan Sea Grant. We're a program through the University of Michigan and Michigan State University Extech Extension along with NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. We help bring science and research from the university and from the different organizations out to communities for them to use. Uh, and so I'm actually not going to be doing much of the work today. Uh, uh, Beth Christensen here is at the Lake Superior State University Center for Freshwater Research and Education. It's actually where I'm housed. So um, she is right across the hall from me and she has put together a great presentation on invasive species in K-12 classrooms. So I will let her take it away. And if you have any questions, again, feel free to use the Q&A section uh, at any point during the presentation today. So, yeah. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, yes, again, welcome to this. I appreciate your time today. And with that in mind, I won't uh, take too much of your time. And my goal is to get through this in about 30 minutes to make sure I can. So just sort of the uh, overview of today, we're going to go through, make sure we understand the difference between natives, non-natives, and invasives, so that we know what we're talking about. Uh, look at some of the uh, laws and uh, regulations that we need to deal with as educators, and then some resources and ideas for alternatives that we can use in the classroom. So my big objective with this is to make sure that we all understand where to find information on invasive species, their environmental impact, and any laws that we can learn alternatives to what we're currently using in the classroom. And also, if we are finding out that we're using uh, an invasive species, how do we take care of that, dispose of it properly? So with that in mind, I'm going to get us warmed up with a little activity here. This will get us thinking about native versus non-native species. And so what I'm going to do is show you photos of uh, native and non-native species, you will have a little bit of information like what is shown here for uh, the two species that we're going to be guessing on. You'll get two pictures, not necessarily in the right order. And what you'll get to do is guess which one is the invasive species and which one is the native species. So we'll do this in the form of a poll. I want to make sure that I'm doing this correctly. That's why Elliot is still here. So we'll go ahead and we'll let you choose based on the pictures and the little hints you have, which one is the invasive species. So again, we're looking for Brazilian Elodea, generally, generally has four leaves uh, and or more, and water weed will have three leaves per whorl. And again, the whorl is what goes around the stem. And so the Brazilian Elodea is the one that was number two, and American water weed is number one. So that's kind of how this is going to go, just kind of a fun way to warm ourselves up. So here's the next one, Eurasian water milfoil which typically has 14 or more leaflets, and the northern water milfoil, which typically has about five to 10 leaflets. And the leaflets are these little um, sections here that you can see. And so what we're gonna do is again, give you the chance to choose which plant is the invasive. And you get to do a quick poll on that and choose, is it number one or is it number two? So the answer is that the first one is the Eurasian water milfoil and the second is uh, the uh, northern water milfoil. The next one is we're looking at Phragmites. We have the native Phragmites uh, as sort of a purpley base and the non-natives are sort of a tan a stem. So hopefully this one's pretty easy. Again, just a quick warm up, getting us in the mood. Which one is the invasive plant? We're going to go ahead and see which one it is. And probably those of you who guessed 
Catan had it right. That is the non-native Phragmites. And just to get a good look at what these can do, uh, this is a photo from a Michigan Tech out, um, outreach event. And that is a student who is standing in a bunch of Phragmites. So they can definitely do some damage. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to show you two pictures. One is a sea lamprey. One is one of our native lampreys, a silver lamprey and do a quick vote as to which one is which based on the information you're given. So the silver lamprey is obviously a little on the silver side and the sea lamprey is a little bit darker. But the sea lamprey is the one um, that is marked number one. And then the final guess is a crayfish. We have the rusty crayfish, which is invasive versus the northern clearwater crayfish. And the rusty tends to have black tips on the end of the pinchers and the clearwater orange tips. Now, these are kind of uh, very basic hints there. It usually takes a little bit more effort than this to uh, identify crayfish, but we found hopefully some pictures that'll make it a little bit easier for you to tell. One of the tips is also a rusty crayfish can look like somebody had a little paint on their fingers and grabbed on the sides of it. The rusty crayfish is the one that was marked number two. So again, hopefully this kind of got us in the mood for thinking about invasive species and there's so many terminologies out there, so many confusing uh, words that are used. What do we mean by all of them? And so we're going to go through really quickly three different definitions. First of all, the native species is one that uh, would have sort of co-evolved with an ecosystem. It's, it's part of a balanced ecosystem with a specific niche. And an example of that would be our very own lake sturgeon. We love those up here in Sault Ste. Marie, as I'm sure others of you love them too. The non-native or exotic species, that one would have been introduced to an area, to an ecosystem through other means. Uh, often humans, there are some exceptions. You might have fur or feathers involved in an introduction. Uh, and it probably doesn't impact the, the ecosystem at all if it is um, just referred to as a non-native species. It's held in check by other parts of the ecosystem. And an example of that would be Atlantic salmon from our hatchery here, Lake Superior State University. Now the final term invasive, an invasive species is one that actually causes harm, whether economic harm or harm to an ecosystem, uh, even human harm. And an example of that might be uh, the famous silver carp that has been sort of terrorizing the uh, Chicago area. We're uh, keeping an eye on that and trying to figure out ways to control that before it gets into Lake Michigan. When we're getting around to these invasive species and why we should care, why we should kind of pay attention to them, the rule of tens kind of comes in handy. So if we think about 100 species that are introduced into an ecosystem, about 10 of those actually survive. And then you have these 10 new species that are in the wild that weren't there, part of the ecosystem to begin with. Out of those, 10% of those survive and can actually become invasive. So 1% out of that original 100 would be invasive species. And that's just really one too many. If we look at, and there's a little bit of a um, website there to refer to that, which you'll get as a resource at the end of this webinar. If we look at what that looks like in terms of this invasion curve, if we can stop the process right here at the introduction, then we have a chance um, of avoiding a whole bunch of cost uh, and a whole bunch of effort as that one introduction can become uh, an out of control situation. So it may be quite a while before detection even occurs. 
And by that time, it may be difficult to come up with an eradication option, uh, something that can even prevent the uh, invasive species from moving into this stage where it becomes a problem and uh, more costly to, to eliminate. Maybe you can only control it instead of eradicating it. And if we can't take care of it during that part, when we go into this uh, section here where we really can only manage it, we can't, you know, we're past the point of eradication. Um, an example of that would be sea lamprey. We are at this point not eradicating them. Uh, it is done on uh, location, local control, and management only. So there are some laws that we need to pay attention to, and I'll give you more resources that will help you look into these. This has to do with our possession and um, our purchase of them primarily. Most of us are not going to be selling these, but if we have them in our possession, then um, that is an issue. So the federal laws that are associated with this uh, if a species is injurious to wildlife, you do need a permit to have it, and that's not something you're just going to get very easily. There are prohibited species as well. I've given you a couple of examples there. And again, uh, possession is an illegal um, offense. You cannot have any of those uh, prohibited species. There are also Michigan laws that uh, prohibit any restrictive, prohibited and restricted species. It's actually unlawful to possess them. And that is where, again, we come into play as educators. And I want to share with you really quickly a website that is referenced there that is where you can get the Michigan.gov invasives. You can get those laws, uh, if you enjoy reading laws, but you can reference them. And then I will show this to you now because we'll get to it in a little bit. Uh, one of the links here actually can give you species and their profiles. So we're going to be talking about aquatic invasive species. We already mentioned Brazilian Elodea. You can get information on whether a species is prohibited, if it's on a watch list, uh, if it's restricted. And so that's an excellent resource that you can go to. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint at this point. One of the things that we want to consider as educators is how we can find alternatives. And the takeaim.org website, which I'll show you a, a little bit later, has some of these alternatives that we can refer to. You can also learn to ID. I just showed you the DNR or the Michigan.gov invasives website. It's difficult with just one photo, but if you click on a link to an organism, you can actually find other photos. And there's other resources as well that can help you with identification. Uh, some of those are human resources, so you could take them to your local um, uh, university if you had uh, some science contacts there, uh, DNR or your local uh, CISMAR cooperative invasive species management area. Also, if you are shipped a plant that you've ordered through a legitimate uh, supply company, make sure that you double check it. It could have other species attached to it, whether it's plant fragment, fragments from um, an invasive species. I've given you just a few examples there. And what you'd like to do is, first of all, rinse it and collect the rinse water, bleach it before you dispose of it. Obviously, you wouldn't bleach any animals that you um, found and ordered specifically for the purpose of use. But these would be any hangers on that are part of a new plant that you ordered uh, and you want to make sure that you are not introducing that. Some alternatives that you might consider using with your classes. 
I know some of you may have used African clawed frogs as part of a curriculum. There are other options, and uh, an example of this is the northern leopard frog or even the bullfrog, both of which are native species. And one of the places I want to show you where I found that information is, as I referred to before, that taking.org website. So you can actually choose the Great Lakes region and click on that, and it will give you alternative species that you can use if you live in the Great Lakes region. And these would be native species, ones that are not invasive. And I know I'm making you dizzy, but I'm gonna to scroll to the bottom of the list, and you'll notice that African clawed frogs are on this list, and there are two alternatives that they've provided for you, the leopard frog and the bullfrog. So instead of you having to do a lot of searching for these resource websites, I've done that for you. So hopefully those will be helpful as you go forward and try to find these alternatives. Another alternative, uh, oh, and I did forget to mention this to you. If you do uh, happen to collect a species from the wild <clears throat> for use in education, um, there's not necessarily a problem with that. It's uh, just that you need to have a DNR collector's permit so that you are official and there is an online application available to you. Here's another alternative I already mentioned, Canadian waterweed. Some of us as educators like to show photosynthesis with uh, putting a, an aquatic plant in water. And it's really interesting to see the oxygen bubbles. They come off and get caught in the leaves. And so students can see that process. But we don't want to use Brazilian elodea or Eurasian water milfoil, both of which are invasives. So here's a couple of options. You could get a plant like Canadian waterweed or Ward Science has algae beads, which can do the same kind of an experiment. They even sell kits where you have different indicators to show, um, you know, CO2 levels in the water versus oxygen, that kind of thing. Again, disposal of these, we'll talk through how to dispose of plants when you're done with them. You would want to dispose of the algae beads as well. And of course, make sure in any case that you are shipped the safe options. If you are uncomfortable identifying them yourselves, then again, get some expert advice before you just kind of start using them and accidentally pitch them into the wild. So here's a couple of decision scenarios, and I don't necessarily expect you to uh, come up with a correct answer, except for the fact that hopefully by the end we'll get an idea of what's the best bet. So we have from the invasive species website, we have uh, Egeria densa, which is prohibited. That's actually that uh, Brazilian water weed. And Ward's science cells, Elodea densa. And so they look like two different things. And so the question is, can I purchase Elodea densa because that's not on the Michigan Invasives website? Well, in fact, the two names are actually synonymous and it took a conversation with a couple of scientists for me to uh, find that answer, but it is, they are synonymous. So uh, don't buy it, don't buy either one of them. And you know, what I learned is ask questions for sure. Uh, Carolina Biologicals, uh, they sell fan wart and they state that regulations don't allow them to ship in these states. And you'll notice that a couple of the states are Great Lakes states. And so it made me wonder if that was the fan wart, fan wart that is prohibited in Michigan. So it says that it'll ship it to anywhere but those locations. However, they are selling the species of fanwort that is prohibited in Michigan. So even though Carolina does not prohibit selling it and shipping it, we want to make sure that we are checking that out before we buy it. 
And by the way, just so you know, there are some non-legitimate places online. I would trust Carolina. I'm sure some of you do. But again, they are relying on us as teachers to make sure that we are purchasing uh, what is correct for our state. Bioaquatics, they sell this stuff too, and they probably don't have as many issues about shipping it. So don't buy it from them either. Carolina also sells Salvinia, and it also has limits to where it can transport it. And there's a whole bunch of Salvinia on our invasive species website that is prohibited in Michigan. And so the only thing Carolina tells us is the genus that it is Salvinia that they're selling. So I have no idea if I can purchase this or not. I would probably say no. So I looked into it, and in fact, Carolina sells a species of Salvinia that is not prohibited in Michigan, so it actually is acceptable to purchase. So if you needed this for an experiment or some investigation, you actually could purchase the one that they sell, even though there's a whole bunch of them that are prohibited in Michigan. You would, of course, just want to make sure that you got Salvinia minima and not one of the others. So I'm going to really quickly break it down. If we want to make sure that what we're doing in our classroom stays in our classroom and actually reduce animal releases, here's the first one. Just never ever release it to the wild. Even if it's a native species that you, know, you collected and you were using, there's a chance that it was introduced to uh, some sort of disease, believe it or not, there are diseases that are uh, invasive to our area as well. And so we just never want to release to the wild if we've been uh, housing it in our classrooms. Also, donate only to an environmental learning center and willing staff at that center. We don't want to just go there and drop it off on the property. We need to make sure that they are interested in that particular species and that they are willing to take it from you because you know that they are part of either your district or a nature center and they, you've had a conversation with them and they say, yes, we can use this in our teaching as well. Never send it home with students. Uh, I think probably a lot of the parents who signed that permission slip that says, yep, Johnny can bring this turtle home or this crayfish home, uh, they probably get tired of it after a few weeks and then are going to likely let it go in the wild. We just don't want to risk it and it's our responsibility. Once it leaves the classroom, it's still our responsibility. As a last resort, if you have purchased or obtained an invasive species uh, that you don't want to keep, well, I should say any species, uh, any animal that you don't want to keep, make sure that you humanely euthanize it. And we here at Lake Superior State University, we have uh, protocols that we go through to euthanize animals. We can certainly help you. We would, we would be willing to, you know, give you advice or help you through that. There's also some other resources that may be able to help you out with that. If we're looking at invasive plant releases, you're going to find some of these are a little familiar. First of all, we're never going to release, release those to the wild. We are only going to donate to willing staff at an environmental learning center not going to just drop them off at the center's property. We're not going to send them home with students. And if we do want to get rid of them, this is uh, goes back to those algae beads or the Elodea. We're going to first seal it in a plastic bag. It could be a, you know, a zipper bag, it could be just a plastic grocery bag, and then we can throw it in the trash. We're not going to compost them. That puts them back out in the wild. And if you have them in an aquarium, go ahead and bleach that aquarium water before dumping down the drain. We don't want to dump that through a storm sewer or other bodies of water. It may look like water, 
but it probably has something else in it besides just pure H2O. So again, you as educators, all of us as educators, we're on the front line. So we're going to make sure that we find alternatives to any plants and animals that we're currently using. We're going to go to legitimate suppliers and again, possibly use that takeaim.org website to find other alternatives. We can also go to the Michigan DNR has disposal guidelines. Uh, these are available through that link there, which again, you'll have this link at the end of this PowerPoint, we'll share it with you. Also, it's kind of an interesting opportunity to educate your students. You can talk with them about why you're choosing the plants and animals that you're choosing. You can talk with them about why you're not sending those home with them. And you can integrate lessons into your classroom as well. This does not have to be a transformation of your whole curriculum. It's a matter of giving you the opportunity to um, just sort of stick that in when you have uh, an opportunity. And then you'll notice that I have a, a whole bunch of other resources for you here. I've given you, I will give you a link also of uh, Google, uh, Google Doc, Google, sorry, Google Doc that has this PowerPoint and a Google Drive folder that you can access uh, all of these resources and more. So I know that was really quick and I'm going to go ahead and stop the share of this for right now. I did notice there were a few questions that came up. So let's go ahead and see. Um, looks like Jeremy's asking about an invasion meltdown. Meltdown. Can you explain what that is and if it is playing out in the Great Lakes ecosystem? Uh, Elliot might be able to yeah, help with that one that so one. that we can kind so of work I, together on that. I think a good example of an invasion meltdown would be the case of alewives back in the I think it was the 70s and 80s. Alewife is a small fish that got into the Great Lakes. Um, from not in the Great Lakes, and it was really good at eating all the plankton and zooplankton in our Great Lakes, and the population went crazy. Um, they were alewife all over the place, but what happened was that that population of alewife really decimated a lot of our local small fish species that were lot eat the same thing, because those alewives didn't have any major predators why our local fish do. Uh, and so that really decimated a lot of our local population, and what also happened is the alewife ate all the food and then they had no food left so they started to die and they literally were washing up in thousands and thousands along beaches and they had to take bulldozers to clear off all these dead little fish washing up so i think that's a good example of an invasion meltdown and we have something kind of similar happen although it wasn't quite a meltdown more of a restructuring with uh, zebra and quagga mussels um so those are kind of some examples i think of when these invasions just completely take over and really just completely disrupt an entire ecosystem. We've been able to rebalance the Great Lakes by the introduction of salmon and other um, large salmonids that eat those alewife, but um, it's kind of set a new normal essentially. So looks like great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it looks like Elaine has a question about if all of the other species in the family are prohibited, doesn't that indicate that it is easily adaptable to our ecosystem? That is an excellent point. And just to be safe, I would probably not purchase that and, and use, you know, make a different choice. But also the bottom line is if you do have it, remember we're not releasing it. We are um, double bagging it if we're getting rid of it and never composting it. So will you know hopefully keep keep that from getting out in the wild but you're right i probably wouldn't risk it to begin with so i don't know if you want to add yeah. more to that elliot or not but. it is it does always behoove us to really make sure that any of the live organisms in our classrooms don't get released into the wild um, unless you have a very specific situation like salmon in the classroom or something where a lot of times those fish are being tested for disease it's really best to just make sure anything that comes in your classroom that's alive um, does not get released into the wild because it could have gained a disease while in your classroom um, or came in with that disease and then maybe got stressed and that disease took hold on that organism. Uh, and so you just really, it, there's not really an opportunity to release an organism out of your classroom unless it's something like um, you're doing a garden 
uh, you know, and you're you're starting those planters and then planting them outside. But again, you really want to make sure that those aren't invasives. Um, and it, when it comes to figuring out what is an invasive and what isn't, that's a really good point. If it's labeled as you know um, a bunch of organisms in the same genus that are invasive, and you find one that's not in that list, it still might be uh, a good idea to find an alternative. I will say that if you want a really comprehensive list of all the invasives, um, that's more comprehensive than the, the state's list, because that's the one that they've really identified and targeted as illegal, but um, you can go to um, the Great Lakes Aquatic Invasive Species Network, and this is just for aquatic invasives, and that's uh, the Glances Network, and that's hosted by NOAA, uh, one of the research centers they have in Ann Arbor, and that's a full comprehensive list of things that could be invasive, or that are invasive that could get in, so it's a little more comprehensive. Uh, so that's a good place to go for aquatics if you want to really make sure. But yeah, we'll make sure that we include that link uh, so that you have that available as well. So thank you for attending. Before you go, please um, do at when we end this webinar, that same pre-survey that we gave you will pop up, and there will be a post-survey. Um, we really would like it if you guys could take that post survey. It's going to help with some of our data collection, seeing how to improve these kinds of webinars. If you're watching this as a recording after the fact, uh, we will have the links, as uh, Beth mentioned. Uh, we'll have those, the link to the Google Drive in the comments of the YouTube section. So again, if you're watching this afterwards, it'll be a comment. If you're watching this live, you'll get an email with the links um, to all of these great resources. And again, I uh, just want to say thank you to Beth for providing this information. And remember, don't let it go <laughs> if it's in your classroom. That's kind of the moral there. Try not to bring invasives in in the first place. And if it's in your classroom, it's a good idea to not let it out in the classroom. All right. Thank all of you. Bye-bye.